I asked Joan what I was supposed to talk about. She said, Alice. Or well, start with Alice. So, all right, we start with Alice. Mm. She had a lot of trouble, you know, with the caterpillar. She said, who are you? And she said, I've had so many changes lately, I don't know. <laughs> she said, explain yourself. She said, I can't do that. And that's one side of the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Another side of the picture is in through the looking glass, in which the net, there's a very sinister sort of railroad carriage they're all traveling in, very dreamy sort of sequence. And the net is a still small voice explaining the insects of Through the Looking Dust Land to Alice. For example, the we in this side of the, in the Through the Looking Dust Land, we don't have butterflies, we have bread and butterflies. And the bread and butterfly has wings of very thin slices of bread and butter and a head made of a lump of sugar. Alice says, what does it live on? And that says, weak tea with cream in it. Alice saw a difficulty. Quote. So she said, what happens if it can't find any? This, you see, being its only chance of survival. And that said, it dies. Alice said, that must happen rather often. And that said, it always happens. <laughs> <laughs> and then I believe to be the, that next after the philosophy of Zola Chic in 189, to be probably the next important contribution to the theory of evolution <laughs> in the 19th century. Uh, that in fact this whole natural selection bit is in fact not a selecting for survival of the, the fitter but is an extermination of those who have not one failing but two failings so related to each other that if A doesn't get you, B will. And if you adjust to A, the fate will be B. If you adjust to B, your fate will be A. Uh, somewhat later in the history of scientific endeavor, this pattern was named the double bind and was regarded as a contribution to psychiatry and not a contribution to evolution. But I suggest to you that these are not really different subjects <coughs> and that that's how the world really is. That what exterminated the dinosaurs was not being too big. It was that if they were any smaller, they would be exterminated. So they had to die of being too big. <laughs> And in principle, although, you see, you then cannot point to the cause of death. The coroner cannot say the bread and butterfly died of finding its food and therefore dissolving its head. It cannot say that it died of not finding its food, it died of starvation. It died of the impossible alternative between the two. And no doubt some bread and butterflies chose one path of death and some chose another. But as the gnat says, it always happens. Okay. Now, I want to sort of hang that one on a peg for future reference. And, and so that it'll be in the backs of your minds while we look at other things.
And the other things I want to look at are, on the whole, what seem, as of 1975, to be the most sophisticated models available for learning evolution and such things. These models go like this. That perhaps the way to open it is with McCulloch's story about his mother. McCulloch was in his 70s, his mother was 90 plus. I think she's still alive. Is she still alive? Does anybody know? He died, but she might be still alive. She was undoubtedly very, very tough. And there was a conference at the house, a little small conference of half a dozen people who were interested in what is now called information retrieval. A word for how to hunt computers for information that you've lost in them somewhere in their memory banks. Or indeed how to hunt the Library of Congress for information. And these young men were discussing this. McCulloch, not so young, sort of encouraging them and putting them in their place. And the old lady sitting there getting more and more restive. Finally, she went off to the kitchen to make some coffee for the group. And Warren followed her to see what was annoying her so much. And found her ready to have a temper tantrum about those young men. They don't know anything about finding things. They think you put a tag on the information so as to find it. You make a note of where you put it. That's no use. You will lose the note. <laughs> <laughs> the way to do it, I, she says, um, have a certain amount of trouble with information retrieval. And the way you do it is you leave something of everything everywhere. <laughs> you have some knitting in the living room, and you have some knitting in your bedroom, <laughs> and you have a spare pair of spectacles in the jar, and a spare pair of spectacles in the kitchen, and wherever you are, there is some of anything that you are likely to need. <laughs> and this is the way you do it. In which indeed she is theoretically, and this is now acknowledged by the best mathematicians and theoreticians, engineers and such like people, is <laughs> undoubtedly the answer to the problem. So, the first step in the problem of learning, in the problem of evolution, which is, as I say, is much the same as learning, is to have some of everything everywhere. And I'm prepared to bet that any of you who've really thought about learning and labs and psychology and all that crud, uh, on the whole, have thought of information as being located. The model of the dictionary in which you run through the alphabet to find uh, whatever it is, parsley, that you want information about. And that'll be under P, well it's near the beginning of the P's because it's PA, and so on. Uh, that is not the way it's done. It is done by having the information everywhere, at any rate within large regions. And you put the information everywhere by essentially the same device that a Stradivarius fiddle will use if you lend it to a small child who will make it squawk. <coughs> It is very unwise to lend a Stradivarius fiddle, priced in the order of $100,000 and supposedly having a beautiful tone, 
to small children. You shouldn't lend these things because they will be made to squawk and it will take a lot of good playing on the fiddle to get the tone back to not squawking. That is, the fiddle will learn to squawk. It will remember how to squawk. And where in the fiddle will the information be located of how to squawk? And the answer is that that information will be located throughout the fiddle, throughout at least its woodwork and perhaps also its strings, perhaps even the bow. Relational patterns <coughs> which exemplify themselves as a squawk when the thing is played uh, become throughout its, its tissues, so to speak. It's, it remembers the way McCulloch's mother remembers by having a bit of the information everywhere. Now, if this be the sort of thing creatures are, how would one make that happen? Well, uh, take something a little more visible than what goes on in a fiddle. Uh, take stationary waves on the surface of a glass of water. You vibrate, we will say, the container, the glass, and as a result, a pattern of waves stands there on the surface, apparently not moving. Of course, it's not a static system. It is a system with dynamics, physical forces, in a literal sense, mapped out through it, and, and thereby holding up the water here and holding it down there and so forth in elaborate balance, which is a summation of the impact of vibration. It's a, a stationary summary of a dynamic operation. Very curious and interesting business, really. The ideal place to put information. So if we invade this surface with its stationary waves with a, a spike from above, every wave in the pattern will now be different. And if you knew the code to read the waves, you could learn about the invader from any part of the wave system. <coughs> mm -hmm. The information is a little bit everywhere. If uh, there were a second invader, the result of this invader will be modified by that invader. Mm -hmm. But if you, again, if you knew the code, you could read about both of them mm -hmm. from the total surface. And I don't know what the economics of such a system will be, how much information you can pickle in how much water, water surface. But I suspect a very great deal. And that's, you know, a very nice sort of model to begin to think about learning with. Instead of a surface with stationary waves, we have an elaborate three or four dimensional fishnet of neural fibers within which we can have a, a tremor, a resonance of impulses traveling to give us, a, in a sense, figures. I don't mean pictures, I mean figures which can conceivably be read, which can be impinged upon in various ways, and then the impingement can be read <coughs> off. And not only that, but these are handy devices because <coughs> imagine a fishnet here. Uh, it's got its threads and its nodes. And I've tweaked it there, and I tweaked it there, and I tweaked it there with, what, fractions of a second between them. And this set up a resonance pattern in those threads. Fine. 
Suppose a little bit of memory, uh, trace facilitation of some kind in the threads. Uh, leave the whole thing alone for a little while. And now, instead of tweaking it at the places where I tweaked it before, I tweak it at places which will be appropriate to that resonance, places within it. Here, 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 here. I shall be setting that resonance going, and there will now be tweaks generated by it at the original three points that I started from. Uh -huh. And this makes a beautiful sort of a model for information retrieval. I mean, what was the name of that man I had lunch with yesterday? I can't remember. Oh, yes, he had a beard and we talked about Galapagos. Yeah, I know, it was so-and-so. You know, that's sort of the way memory goes. That this piece of information, that piece of information, that piece of information used to set up a resonance the resonance will now generate the missing piece mm -hmm. that you're looking for. It was Professor Jones and I was talking about Galapagos with him, right? Fine. Now, all I've said so far is that's a model. A model which we might use to think about various things that go on in our lives internal, external, roundabout, up and down. And what is it to be alive? It is, I suggest, to be a living model of this general sort of kind of business. Uh, the technical term nowadays for this way of thinking uses the word hologram, and the original hologram models are derived from lasers and photographic techniques exceeding the physical operations. Uh, you don't obviously <coughs> have any lasers inside your head. Uh, lasers are convenient because you can generate resonance systems of light waves with them, which are roughly analogous to what I've been talking about. Uh, we can get into a lot of trouble by discussing the physics of lasers, which is only in a very formal sense relevant to what we're talking about here, because you don't have any lasers in your heads. Nor indeed do you have surfaces of water, nor steady various fiddles. Uh, but the metaphors are perhaps useful. As Browning, Robert Browning, the poet said, a man's reach should exceed his grasp. Else what's a metaphor? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I'm not kidding. <laughs> uh, I'm not kidding because let me hang up another thing on the the pegs here. First of all, we hang up the notion of the bread and butterfly that is killed because of an incompatibility between adaptation to the alternatives A and B, either adaptation being lethal. That's hanging on that peg. Uh, now hanging on this peg is the idea of these uh, stationary waves and such things. And Station, modified stationary waves as codes which can conceivably be read, therefore become stacks of information. Damn it, I wanted to hang up another one. Uh, Where was I going? Information. Well, 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 we're going along all right. But I wanted to get that one out of the way so I could. Anyway, never mind. Uh, the next thing, I think, 
is to get the idea that these Oh, yes, I knew what the next thing was I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a story which I've told in this room before. We've got no repeats of personnel except no. grown-ups, yes? <laughs> um, I mean faculty. <laughs> um, the story is of the man who asked his computer, do you compute that you will ever think like a human being? And the computer translated this into whatever its language was, Algol or something, Fortran. I, mean, no, I guess he translated it into Fortran. And the computer worked on the question and finally printed the answer. And the man ran to get the answer on the piece of paper and the piece of paper I had on it printed, quote, that reminds me of a story, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, this is a very serious matter and undoubtedly true that the way in which human beings think, certainly the way I think, is in terms of stories. You see, and this is one of the weaknesses, really, of hardware are presently sold and called computers, that they really don't think in terms of stories. And this makes them sort of inhuman and rather uninteresting. But we undoubtedly think in terms of stories. Now what is a story? A story, so please you, is a metaphor. The essence of a story, uh, Blake is, you know, poking fun at the rest of the world and comparing their Messiah with his Messiah to the disadvantage of their Messiah. His Messiah was better, of course. Their Messiah, he says, is the friend of all mankind. Uh, your Messiah is the friend of all mankind. <coughs> parenthesis, which obviously nobody could ever be. Mine, he says, speaks in parables to the blind. And this is perhaps the only sort of speech that's really worth talking, you know. All right, we now have hanging on the... It's like a sort of gamekeeper's larder. Game Gamekeepers don't have larders in America, do they? What a gamekeeper's larder is? They don't have gamekeepers. A gamekeeper's larder is a set of nails, usually on the door of the gamekeeper's cottage in the woods, in which he hangs the stoats, dead stoats, the ferrets, the blue jays, and other vermin that he has shot. So we hang <laughs> at one end the bread and butterfly. And then we hang the uh, hologram memory. And now we are hanging the question of the nature of a metaphor. A metaphor being a story, being a parable, being another way of talking about what all this junk is that we call living, interacting, communicating, computing, thinking, what not, living. You might not think metaphor was so important. And American children in school are not really told about metaphor at all. They're told that simile is a good thing and metaphor is for poet. Well, may I have a flower? Uh, this fellow is a little difficult for what I wanted, but it'll do. Um, if you go to the baths and look down from the baths towards the sea, down the cliff, 
you will see that the water has made wet places on the almost vertical cliff face. And in those wet places, you will see a plant growing, which doesn't look at all like this one. Uh, it's bright yellow, it's the same color. It's quite juicy and flobby, succulent sort of thing, growing in very wet places. Uh, the flower is about twice that big. And these are skinny, you know. This is a skinny sort of a plant at best. Uh, but there is, it has a cousin growing down there on the wet places of the cliff. Mimulus luteus, the little mimic. This is called monkey flower, I think, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, this is the dry sagebrush chaparral species, which you might compare. I don't have them both here. I had planned to get both, but I couldn't find out how to get one from the cliff face. I'm not sufficiently athletic, but it's there. And no doubt if you look at cliff faces in other places where it's wet, I know it's a sand dollar. Uh, you will see that the two plants are essentially metaphors one of the other. Uh, that this matter of metaphor is right at the bottom of being alive for plants as well as you and me. How do you know that that thing between an elephant's eyes is its trunk? Well, what is said by being its trunk, you avoided actually saying what you mean by calling it a trunk. You've gone into another metaphoric world by calling it a trunk. Uh, what you actually want to say is that it's a nose. Why is it a nose? Well, it's a nose because it's got two eyes, one on each side. Uh, why is it a nose? Because it's divided by a central nasal septum, and there are two tubes, which if it had fingers it could pick, but it, it's the only finger is on the end of its nose, so it can't pick its nose. Um, but it's undoubtedly a nose. You see, functionally it's not really a nose because it can't pick it. But formally, in a serious and formal sense, it is a nose because it has all the structure of a nose and indeed looked like any other nose until the alligator pulled the elephant's child's or however the evolution happened, I don't know. Um, all right. So we've got these formal structures running through the world uh, the most famous is the one that Goethe discovered, which is that stems, uh, what he did was to do to plant anatomy what uh, Chomsky has more recently done to grammar. Uh, you were probably brought up to believe, or generally the older ones among you, were brought up to believe that a noun is the name of a person, place or thing, a verb is the name of an action, and go is a verb. Right? Uh, now, if you begin looking at that, it's very unsatisfactory, and it's much more satisfactory to say that a noun is the subject of sentences containing verbs, uh, verbs are in a certain relationship to nouns, having them as their subjects and objects and such things. And go, in the sentence go is a verb, is undoubtedly a noun, because it's the subject of the sentence. Um, that is, he substituted a language, he, Chomsky, is substituting a language of relationship for a language of naming the relata, the, the things related. And you only name them by virtue of their relationships. That's the trick of it. And what Goethe discovered is that a stem is that part of a plant which bears leaves. And what is a leaf? 
A leaf is that part of a plant in the angle of which stems grow, called buds. Mm -hmm. uh, and these, these are rather elaborate stems which are modified to make flowers. Uh, these yellow things, petals and sepals, etc., being essentially modified leaves. Or, as you may say, metaphors of leaves. Transforms of leaves. Meta and trans are the same word, approximately. Meta is the Greek word for trans in Latin. So, a metamorphosis is a transformation. And the metaphor is a transfer, yes? Fine. The biological world is organized in terms of formal relations such that the formal relations here and the formal relations in that canna, whatever it is, and the formal relations in that hemlock plant, if that's what you call it in this country, parsley or something. Uh, these are massively comparable systems of formal relations. They are stories, a story being an aggregate of formal relations scattered in time to make a sequence having a certain sort of a minuet formal dance to it. <coughs> now it gets a little more complicated. Right, we hang up the notion of metaphors and stories. It gets more complicated because you and I are living creatures of whom the things which I've so far said are in some abstract sort of way true. This is where we live, so to speak. And the funny thing about living there is that we care about it very intensely. And when the metaphors get jangled by either unfortunate events or bastards <coughs> or whoever it is that maltreats us, we get very upset. <coughs> you see, the idea that there's any sort of a mental process going on which is not metaphoric, <coughs> is a very late sort of school marmish idea really protestant at best and what they were burning each other for in the 14th century was metaphor does the bread is the bread the body is the wine the blood the catholic said yes it is. The Protestant said, no, it stands for. Bread stands for the body. And they felt at that time that this difference between the two views, whether life is made of metaphors or life is made of similes, was worth burning for. And on the whole, those who got burned unless they just got trapped in the administrative <coughs> procedure or something like that. But those who were really burned for these causes felt on each side that this was a legitimate cause to be burned for. Nobody would think that today. I don't know, maybe not, maybe so. Um, anyhow, uh, the point being, you see, that whatever it is that we call the right hemisphere, which five years ago we were calling the Archipelium. Um, older than that, we were calling the heart. The set of mental processes concerned with aesthetics, quote, feelings, um, poetry perhaps, the poetic aspect of poetry, because of course it's also a prose aspect, 
all that stuff is precisely where dream is made. Dream is metaphor of the same general sort that I'm talking about. And roughly the Protestant view of the sacrament that the bread stands for the body was a policy decision to exclude from the church that part of the mind which is concerned with poetry, feelings, fantasy, metaphors, stories, and bread and butterflies. Uh, and on the whole, of course, the result has been the total secularization of religion, which is roughly what the Catholics knew would happen already when it began that way. They've now forgotten how it happened, and they are now busy secularizing their own church. <laughs> And interestingly enough, I, I, I wish somebody would explain this to me, while the Catholics are busy translating the Mass into English and celebrating it, I may say, in rather indifferent English, uh, the rising generation is busy learning Sanskrit and intoning Om mantras of various kinds. <laughs> what? Eight o'clock tomorrow morning. Yeah, but there must be a reason for this. <laughs> <laughs> what do you suppose it is? I don't know. I suspect it's your fault, John. <laughs> 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 hmm. people like you, you know. Mm. I mean, I'm Protestant, of course, you understand. <laughs> um, always raised to be no not exactly not exactly however I guess I've said enough I've said quite a lot hmm? I'd like to ask you a question I thought that would be <laughs> I'd like to ask you about the visionary state Um, how the visionary state of being can relate to what can perhaps be occurring in a context such as ours where there is a, a very conscious process of decontextualization. Yeah, I, I have sort of an idea of what language has been exchanged in this room. Uh, what the question as I hear it would be something like this uh, if I take somebody and put them through a set of experiences which will mush up the sense of context <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why is it, why would I expect them to start hallucinating? <laughs> that right? I mean, do I translate you right? You translate me right for you. <laughs> all right, that's all I ask. Uh, this is called the double bind theory of schizophrenia. <laughs> Uh, the double bind of schizophrenia, the theory of schizophrenia, is, I may say, also the double bind theory of laughter and humor. Because these are very closely related things. Mm -hmm. It's much more fun, on the whole, sometimes to laugh rather than face the various sorts of cities and hallucinatory figures who come to twist one's tail and poke one's guts, whatever they do. Why would I expect this to happen? I would expect it because
Uh, if you approach the whole matter the other way round, and say, well, Gregory, uh, do you see the pattern of uh, rays and lights and shadow around that central lamp? Uh, yes. <laughs> 